Welcome, everyone. My name is Rex Dufour. I work for the National Center for Appropriate Technology, NCAT, and I'll be your host today. NCAT is a 501c3 nonprofit and manages the ATRA project, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which is the National Sustainable Ag Information Service, and uh, which is a great resource for farmers. So I urge you to check it out. That's A-T-T-R-A. Funding for this webinar is provided by the Better Cotton Initiative, BCI. BCI is a nonprofit working to transform cotton production across the globe. They and their partners provide training and licensing on sustainable farming practices to more than 3 million cotton farmers in over 21 countries. So I'm pleased to see so many folks interested in this topic. Uh, attending today's webinar, um, which is Practices Supporting Sustainable and Economic Cotton Production. We've got a lot to cover today, so we'll monitor any questions submitted on the Questions tab in the GoToWebinar window on your screen. So if you have any questions, just type them in, and we'll get to them at the end of the program. And um, so this is scheduled to be an hour. Uh, with the questions, we might go a little bit longer than an hour. Uh, so, uh, but please be patient with your um, questions and put them in and we'll get to them, or most of them. If we don't get to your question, uh, we will answer it uh, in a recorded version of the webinar and uh, you can go to the ATRA website to see that. Also, please do fill out a short survey at the end of uh, today's program. It's only three questions and uh, we'd sure like your input. Now, I'd like to get right to the introductions of today's speakers. Um, I'm gonna be speaking first, but after myself, uh, Gwendolyn Ellen uh, will be speaking. Gwendolyn is the owner manager of Agricultural Biodiversity Consulting. And Gwendolyn is a longtime friend. Um, we've been working together uh, for about 15 or 20 years. Uh, she's very skilled. She's got over three decades of experience working in sustainable and organic agriculture as an organic vegetable farmer, uh, ornamental and research greenhouse manager, uh, farmer's market manager, field consultant in integrated biological pest management, and educator. She has managed farmer-led agricultural programs conserving agricultural biodiversity in the academic and nonprofit sector, as well as research in entomology, botany, plant pathology, and crop and soil science in Western agroecosystems. And she'll be talking about annual habitat a bit. And we're very pleased to have Adam uh, Chapel, uh, who's a cotton farmer. Adam and his brother, Seth, operate 8,000 acres of farmland in Cotton Plant, Arkansas. And after studying botany and entomology at Arkansas State and uh, University of Arkansas, go Razorbacks, Adam developed an early interest in the benefits of less conventional farming methods like regenerative agriculture. He planted his first cover crop uh, back 10 years ago in 2010 to better manage pigweed, which was really cutting into his farming profits. And he has been experimenting with and learning about managing cover crops ever since. Adam has a bachelor's in science in botany from Arkansas State University and a master's in science in entomology from University of Arkansas. Uh, as I said before, my name is Rex Dufour. I've been with NCAT since 1994. I opened the California office in 2001. My work focus is learning from farmers and training farmers and ag professionals on ecological pest management and ecological soil management. I'm registered as a as an, uh, with NRCS as a technical service provider in California and Nevada, and I'm also a former licensed pest control advisor in California. So uh, these are the presenters. There's uh, Gwendolyn on your left, uh, Adam on your right, and that's me below there. And um, so today, we're going to be talking about practices that support sustainable and economic cotton production. We'll be talking about investing in your farm's infrastructure, but in this case, it's investing in the farm's biological infrastructure, both above ground and below ground. 
just as you would invest in buying or maintaining farm equipment or maintaining buildings. It really boils down to investing in your soil. But to invest in your soil, to make those investments effective, you have to understand how and why soils function as they do. So I think we have a lot to learn in that respect. Humans have been doing agriculture for about 10,000 years or so. Nature's been doing ecosystems sustainably without fertilizers and pesticides for hundreds of millions of years. So perhaps we can take some lessons from nature and apply them to our agricultural ecosystems for our benefit. For example, this picture shows cotton no-till drilled into a killed cover crop. Now the cover crop uh, protects the soil surface during winter rains, creating a barrier to the impact of raindrops. And by having roots in the ground during the winter rains, it provides routes for the water to infiltrate into the soil profile. The cover crop also feeds the soil in a couple different ways. Once the plant is killed, its organic matter decomposes and enriches the soil. However, most folks don't realize that plants typically exude up to 50 or 60% of the photosynthates that they produce through their roots. And these exudates are no accidental leak. They support populations of bacteria and fungi, which in turn provide access to minerals and other plant nutrients that otherwise the plant wouldn't have access to. Now this picture, this is pretty typical cotton ground in California uh, during the winter, it's bare ground. I would note that it's pretty rare in nature to see vast expanses of bare ground. Um, this is, the bare ground is not protected from winter rains. Uh, unfortunately, it's a pretty common site throughout the country but the bare ground also, it starves the soil microbes, which really drive soil function. Plus, um, you know, when rains come, there's no protection of the soil against these raindrop bombs. And, you know, the raindrops hit uh, the soil surface, they impact the soil, they separate the aggregations of sand, silt, and clay. And these aggregates are incredibly important to soil function. Um, if you separate these aggregates, uh, you can see on the right uh, diagram, uh, the clay particles seal the surface. And after that surface is sealed with the clay particles, uh, you're not gonna have much more infiltration of the rain. Uh, or irrigation water. Um, it doesn't inf infiltrate efficiently. Well aggregated soils, which is diagrammed on the left, um, allows not only water to infiltrate into the soil, but also air. Sealing, you know, if your soil is not well aggregated or it's not well protected, that sealing creates anaerobic conditions in the root zone, which is very conducive to plant disease. So I want to talk a little bit more about soil aggregates. Uh, it's one of the more, most important attributes of well-managed soil. You know, if they, if you can hold those soil aggregates together, um, that's a really good thing for your nutrient cycling. It's good for uh, water and air infiltration, but it's the fungi and bacteria that create glues which hold the sand, silt, and clay particles together. And those in turn allow water and air to infiltrate into the soil. The fungi and bacteria feed on organic matter, which consists of root exudates, decaying roots, plant stalks, leaves, you know, any kind of plant residue. But without regular additions of organic matter, the glues disappear. Soil aggregates come, crumble at the first sign of a raindrop or an irrigation drop impact and sealing occurs with all the negative impacts on soil function. So that's all I have to say about that. I'm gonna, um, I just wanna talk a little bit about uh, 
habitat. Gwendolyn will be talking in a lot more detail about annual habitat plantings coming right up. But here are some uh, what might be considered crazy ideas from California cotton growers using annual habitat. Uh, first tried in the 1960s with alfalfa, the top two pictures, uh, you know, that was first introduced in uh, late 60s. Um, alfalfa as a uh, as a site for beneficial habitat, but it needs to be kept physiologically young. So you need to keep part of the alfalfa interplanting physiologically young in order to uh, make it more attractive to the ligus bug uh, than the cotton. And ligus prefers uh, alfalfa to cotton. And on the bottom two pictures, you can see uh, some cotton growers have been experimenting with planting annual habitat of a sunflower, mustard, corn, sorghum, um, Sudan grass, you know, they get pretty creative, but these act um, as a beneficial habitat refuge as well as a dust barrier because all of these uh, habitats are planted next to roads. And when you have dust, you have mites associated with that dust and uh, you have mite outbreaks. And just wanna uh, mention a few resources. There's a sustainable cotton production in the humid south. That's a free download on the ATRA website. There's a managing soil for water, how five principles of soil health support water infiltration and storage. That's also a free download from the ATRA website. Um, the Better Cotton Initiative, there's the website and uh, we can give you a direct contact in the US um, uh, if you're interested. And then Fibershed is also another um, group working to localize uh, production and processing of fibers in uh, the US. So I think that's it for me and I'm gonna turn it over to Gwendolyn. All right, thanks Rex. I really um, appreciate you talking about all that soil and, and all those practices, which I have to say, none of them appeared very crazy to me. I'm trying to get my slide up here. Well, I seem to be having trouble getting my slide up. Somebody want to help me out with that? In the meantime, ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, all the practices that we're going to talk about today are increasing agricultural biodiversity at various levels on your farm. And so I want to talk to you generally about that. So down at the bottom, you'll see uh, on the bottom right, you'll see an insect. So uh, we can increase these habitat for insects through flowering resources, but we also, the practices that we are going to be talking about, increase those soil microbes that Rex was telling you how important they are, and Adam is also going to tell you how important that is today. But not only at the insect or soil level, but biodiversity occurs, occurs at organism level as well. So we increase plantings, we might do some perennial plantings on the edge or conserve some other habitat on the farm and that's going to increase the organisms such as the nighttime predator of the rodents on your farm, the barn owl, or the daytime predator which got put on the end here on the left, the kestrel. Uh, we see here some native plants that uh, also increase the diversity of the structure of the soil and the consistency of the plants you use, but also your crop rotations and your um, your cover crops increase the diversity of the, the plants that are in the field. So in this middle picture, we see wheat on one side, an insectary strip of alyssum in the middle and potatoes on the other side. And you see that's a very diverse system and these diverse crops will break up the pest cycles of the cotton pests on your farm. And that's what, um, so that was, therefore we get to see some biological pest management. So there are a lot of other um, 
there we go, benefits from, uh-oh, how do I go back? Okay, there are other benefits to increasing your on-farm biodiversity. Jeez, sorry guys, I apologize for this. I didn't have any trouble with this yesterday. Okay, um, and those include increasing the environmental resiliency of your farm. So that resiliency is the ability to overcome setbacks or, or climatic, climatic ch challenges, weather challenges like drought and flood. Adam is going to be very specific about that in his, in his presentation. It can mitigate the effects of pesticide drift. As you can see from my slide, that habitat keeps those pesticides in this field from going into the riparian area. It'll stabilize soil erosion because of roots, but also because of increased diversity of microbes in your soil. It increases overall soil and watershed health. It can decrease dust, as Rex pointed out, but also weed seed migration into your field, and it competes with invasive weed species, and if you're doing a perennial habitat for a very long time. You can also increase your crop pollination and your beneficial, uh, your crop pest management through beneficial insects by providing the resources, the floral resources and food resources that beneficial insects and native pollinators need. And all of those benefits also interpret into an increased farm economic resiliency. And that's very important. It stabilizes your yields. It increases your uptake of water and keeping water on the farm. It can, um, increase your yields, it increases fertility sometimes, and it decreases the production costs and the costs from the inputs that you have to put in, in terms of pesticides and, and in Adam's case, in terms of fertility inputs. Uh, it creates access to sustainable markets. So there's a lot of reasons to um, continue agricultural biodiversity. Heck, a roo, this is so sensitive today and it wasn't yesterday, I so apologize. So how are farmers increasing, cotton farmers increasing on-farm biodiversity? Uh, well, did I skip a slide? I'm so sorry. The biggest, easiest step is to recognize the biodiversity that already exists on your farm. You may have forested edges, you may have riparian areas that have native species, you may have steep rocky hills that you don't farm, and these often contain a real diverse population of native plants, beneficial insects, and native pollinators. So um, recognizing these areas and conserving them is your first step. Uh, decreasing practices you might use there, like grazing or overgrazing or continual mowing or continual pesticide use there, surveying them, recognizing what are the resources in terms of native plants and beneficial insects and what are the invasive species there and um, managing those invasive species. <clears throat> So here are some pictures that I want to show you down below. This is uh, on the right, on the left, I'm sorry, is a lowland, what we call a slough here, where a farmer has increased the native um, habitat there and has increased uh, you know, thousands fold the biodiversity on his farm. Uh, the middle picture is just merely a farmer who had stopped mowing in a riparian area where there were not bad invasive weed species. And there's eight to 12 different native plant species on that edge. The biggest picture is uh, an enhancement of a, of a field edge and a center pivot, but there's native plantings and there are also uh, annual and perennial plantings of horticultural plants in there as well. So just ways you might think about doing that. You could also think about well, I'll talk about that in a minute. So some other practices that cotton growers are already using are crop rotations. Again, I've talked to you about how that's gonna break up the crop pest cycle and it's very important. And cover crops. Now cover crops are the superheroes of agricultural biodiversity because they have so many purposes. They do so many different things. They increase soil fertility. They increase uh, water uptake and weed management. You, they can be a seed crop themselves. They can provide pollination and, and conservation of biological um, 
beneficial insects. Uh, if you add a little flower to them, uh, you'll have to bear with me. My slides are a little bit different than how they went in and how they came out. So, so uh, sorry for that. But if you add a flowering resource to your cover crop, which you might want to consider, then you are going to be bringing in beneficial insects that will target aphids, mites, thrips, Ligus bugs, the army bud and cutworms, boll weevil larvae, and moth eggs. So I want to, I hope this next slide is showing you some of those flowering cover crops. Yes. So here's a picture of a mustard flowering cover crop that flowers early, which is fantastic to bring in those beneficials early. It's also in a little apathic cover crop, so it's providing when it breaks down the stem and the roots, it, can, it provides a chemical suppression of weed germination, and it's next to an onion crop right there. Uh, down below, in the middle, you will see a flowering um, plant called Phacelia tanacetifolium that can be added into your winter cover crop, like um, cereal rye, or in this case, oats, and provide flowering. And if you're gonna do your, if you're gonna till your cover crop in, work your cover crop in before the flower occurs, although it occurs pretty early, pretty early in the season, you can leave a strip along the edge, or consider leaving a strip along the edge that you let flower for that for those resources for those beneficial insects. And down below is a beautiful picture of buckwheat, which is a summer flowering cover crop. It's a quick bloomer. It's a good crop to put in. Um, so the beneficials that you'll see from these flowering, these specific ones, are parasitic wasps, hoverflies, lacewings, true bugs, lady beetles, spiders. So, so they occur in great numbers once their habitat is there. Um, these are pictures of configurations of annual insectary in field plantings. Now, insectary plantings are just a way to say that these plantings are providing the resources that beneficial insects need. Okay, and that's that's refuge from the practices that you're using, a place to reproduce and overwinter, and food in the form of flowers and prey. So uh, one simple annual insectary is a strip of sunflowers. So adding that on the edge of your field with other flowers that you might want to put in there horticulturally, it increases the true bugs. And those are the ambush bugs, the minute pirate bugs, bugs that love to eat on ligus bug if that's a problem in your field. Uh, and, and very simple to do. The other picture on the right is a block of planting. So this is, happens to be cilantro, really easy to put in, not expensive, and you can put a strip or a block on the end of your field. Down below, you'll see there's strips of alyssum. I'm sure cotton growers are not going to do it that way, but you can have strips in between your field of alyssum. And so the, the figures you see here are from studies that were done that show aphid density was significantly reduced by 75 percent in these fields adjacent to these insectary plantings and also that the occurrence up at the top of hoverflies, lady beetles, and lacewings up to 339 percent for the lady beetles 177 because you need some forest planting in there to really increase that and lacewings at 233 percent with in the insectary planting. So these studies are showing us that the insects, the beneficial insects do appear and they do go out in your field and they do predate on your pest. Um, <clears throat> now there are perennial plantings, insectary plantings as well. There's a larger learning curve for doing these, but it's well worth learning doing them because then you have the benefits for a longer period of time. And the simplest perhaps would be the beetle bank. So that's what you see on the top left. So that is a strip of native grasses. It can also be orchard grass, uh, not a native grass um, in most upland prairie situations, but uh, this provides refuge for a lot of beneficials, but mostly we're targeting the predaceous ground beetles that eat slugs, eat slug eggs, eat snails, um, will eat all the larvae of at all life stage of the ligus on the soil and on 
in within the soil. So predaceous ground beetles increase in diversity and in numbers when you have these pot, the, these refuges for them. Then the other pictures are just different configurations of hedgerows. So down below the beetle bank there is a hedgerow that shows you what you want to work for um, on the edge of your field. If you're spraying pesticides, you want that open top canopy uh, because the pesticides can go through and not form a cloud cover. Same for it's on the side of the road. And so the dust, if you don't have that open canopy and the tree part of your hedgerow, that'll just roll over like a big storm on your crops. So, and then on the very right, we have a hedgerow that is timed to flower for the entire season with native plants. So those are just to give you some ideas of practices you can use. The most important thing I want to tell you as a farmer myself is that it's very important to configure these plantings within your farming system, within the cotton production system. I know as a farmer, if I can't do it within my production system, I'm not going to do it. If I don't do it, the benefits and the resources won't be there. And so that's why we have Adam Chapel here and he's going to speak to you next because he's going to tell you what practices he has chosen um, that are good, then they all increase his biodiversity and how they've done that and the benefits they bring to his farm. So Adam, I'm I'm going to turn this over to you. All right. Let's see, do I have... Well... There it goes. All right. Yeah, so I'm Adam Chapel. I farm in Cotton Plant, Arkansas, which is halfway between uh, Memphis and Little Rock. I'm about seven miles north of Interstate 40. So if you want to get on Google Earth, you can probably find me there. But uh, what I want you to do is suspend your uh, the knowledge of cotton production temporarily, because uh, everything I'm going to tell you is going to challenge everything that you know about traditional cotton production so just keep an open mind and if you got questions i'll try to get to them at the end but uh i followed my brother in the in cotton plant uh we're fourth generation in that area um like rick said we started experimenting with covers in 2010 and we actually planted our first cover in the fall of 2009 and then planted cotton into it in 2010 spring of 2010 but uh, from then to now, our yields have remained competitive for our area. And the reason I make that statement is because we, we're crop share farmers. We rent 90% of the ground we farm. Um, so if we don't keep our landlords happy uh, with uh, competitive yields, they'll find somebody else that will. Uh, that's just the nature of the beast. That's how crop share works. So, uh, but what has been a game changer for us is through this transition, we're making those competitive yields with 50 to 60% of the budget that we were prior to this regenerative transition. So that's been hugely significant for us uh, for a number of reasons. And we'll get into those as we go along here. Uh, Rex also mentioned I am formally educated. You may not think so at the end of this presentation, but I did get a BS in botany and an MS in entomology. And um, that's when I kind of learned that farming is just ecosystem management. And up to 2009, we had done a very poor job of ecosystem management. So uh, we, we had to make changes. Um, in integration of this system, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You know, you can do cover crops but not no-till, or you can no-till and not do cover crops. But when you stack all of these diversity principles and soil health principles on top of one another, the end result, it's an exponential increase in soil health and uh, input reduction and, and, and things. It's not just 
one plus one is two, it's one plus one is four and and then eight and then you know twenty. It's it's it just adds it adds on top of itself exponentially. I I just wanted to stress that. So changes we've made, we went to no till and in the Arkansas Delta, Mississippi River Delta, uh, you'll still get told no till is impo is impossible. Um uh, uh, we have kept tillage to a minimum in the last 10 years we've had to do tillage one time uh, and it was after it was this actually this past year we had the wettest fall on record and getting our crop out we kind of destroyed the ground we had ruts to fix so that's the first tillage event we'd had in a decade uh in the in the arkansas delta so that's significant uh, we always keep residue on the soil we do not till in green manures we leave everything on top we try to keep living plants in the soil 365 days a year. Um, and within those living plants, we try to allow for as much diversity as possible. Um, you know, multiple species, flowering species like Gwendolyn talked about, we try to do, we try to uh, do that. And, and also for diversity, we rotate crops. So we're not cotton on cotton for a hundred years. We're uh, corn, cotton, soybeans, or soybeans, rice, uh, we we rotate our crops to add to that diversity um, and then have cover crops in between. And then the last thing we've started is integrating livestock. So this guy right here is why we had to make a change. Palmer pigweed, I don't know where all of the viewers are from in the United States, but if you have this weed, Lord help you, because it is, it is vicious and it was single-handedly putting us out of business. We were spending between 100 and $150 an acre just to control this one weed. So we um, we had some major, major trouble with this guy. Um, you know, we were burning through equity, trying to figure out how to control him, spending money like crazy. Um, well, there it goes. And we were going to meetings and, and trying to figure this thing out in our extension service, our crop consultants, reseller, salesmen, they all told us we need to add more products, more modes of action, you know, overlap residual products, use tillage, hand hoeing, uh, get the cultivators out that your grandpa used, you know, and uh, then praying was another one we got, but that's the only one on the list that's free. So, uh, you know, all of those things can work if you get weeds before they emerge or while they're really small. And with those residuals, you got to have activating rainfall or an irrigation event. You got to get really good coverage. And if they go to seed, then you're starting over all over again. And the bottom line is you got to have the money to do those things. And that was the problem we were running into. We were running out of money fast to fight this fight. So. In 2009, I started investigating cultural ways to manage this weed because um, what we were doing was not working. I mean, we were clean, but we were also going broke. So I started on YouTube, um, you know, no-till and cover crops. I'd, I'd never even heard of such things. I'd heard of no-till, but I'd never heard of cover crops. So I got on YouTube and started looking at organic growers. And for the most part, they relied heavily on tillage. And I knew that was a non-starter for us because every time we tilled, we get a new flush of pigweed. So I noticed uh, this guy here, this pumpkin head 81. Uh, this was the video that got me cranking on cover crops. But I noticed that this video was published in June and it was in Pennsylvania. And I didn't know if they had pigweeds or not, but I knew they had to have problem weeds. But this guy did not have any weeds. He had a huge stand of this grass called cereal rye that I'd never heard of. I noticed he had planting equipment that was not too special. Uh, so I, I realized quickly I didn't have to have a bunch of fancy planting equipment to do this. And and he was clean. He just rolled that cereal right down with a crimper roller and then planted pumpkins into it. And then I followed him the rest of the year. He had a beautiful pumpkin crop with a uh, very little weed uh, emergence. So I thought we had stumbled on to the answer. So I had to figure out what cereal I was in order to get it. Um, now, 
to just emphasize how important this transition has been to us, uh, we were already going downhill fighting pigweed. And if we had not changed to regenerative and reduced inputs, we have met over the last decade several events that would have been farm bankruptcy type events if we had not been saving the money we were saving. So in 2011, we had historic flooding. And this is a picture of our home farm. That's my father's house, um, you know, floating in muddy river water. Um, there it is from my duck boat, just a ways away. Uh, so he lost his house and, and the home farm got washed away. And then my brother lives right down the road from him. He lost his house. Um, this is how I picked my brother and his dog up before the river broke. So 2011 was not a good year for us. Um, you know, we battled flooding of historic proportions. And then we did lick a crop and then 2012 came. Uh, we had historic drought and heat. If you're watching from the Midwest or the Southeast, you will remember 2012. Uh, for Arkansas, it was the hottest on record. Uh, it breaking records from 1980, which my dad and grandfather always talk about. And at this point, we had about 2,300 acres planted to cover crop and no till. The rest was still the way we did it before. And we noticed that our regenerative systems made very good crops and our conventional tilled systems did not. And this is under intensive irrigation. So um, this was when the light bulb popped on. We knew we were on the right track for weed control, but this is when we noticed all the other benefits that cover crops can bring, uh, like the irrigation reduction, infiltration, keeping soil cool, keeping microbes alive. This is when Pandora's box really opened. Uh, 2013, we planted as much as we could get, and we um, got almost the entire farm covered, and that resulted in major reductions of inputs, uh, specifically pest control, whether it be insects or weeds. Uh, fertility need uh, was reduced. Um, the irrigation was a huge one. We did not have to irrigate at all hardly that year, and uh, normally we would have been every seven days. So we had a major reduction in inputs. We had a really good year in 2013, which is good because in 2014, we made a really good crop and we sold our grain to a local grain buyer that had been in business for a long time. Uh, and we did not get paid for that grain. So uh, we got skinned alive on this deal. Again, without two years of major input reduction, this would have been another one that would have taken us out of business completely. So survive, you know, regenerative transition has meant survival for our farm. And I just put that in there because I think it needs to be emphasized. But, you know, without all those bad events, uh, I never would have learned about cover crops and what it could do, you know, regenerative ag and what it could do for me. Um, you know, when you're, when you're painted in a corner, you find out what you're made of. And they've known this for a long time. So I've got this quote in my office and in my truck and in my checkbook. And when I think I'm backed against the wall, uh, it calms me down and I, and I try to formulate a plan instead of panicking. So uh, that's a good one for you. And the other thing that we try to keep in mind is just because your neighbors do it that way, your dad did it that way, your grandpa did it that way, that doesn't mean it's the only way to be done. There is always a better way, always, without fail. The way I'm doing things now is not the best. Uh, it can be improved on, and we try to improve on it every year. Uh, so we try to keep that in our mind also. So tillage, we just eliminate it as possible. And if we have to do it, it is because we are have zero other options. And these are all the things it does. It brings weed seeds to the viable zone. It just destroys soil carbon and organic matter um, because it allows uh, bacteria to flourish on it and just eat it up. Soil structure and aggregates get destroyed, which reduces your infiltration rates. Just tons of bad things. Uh, all your soil life is disrupted and in most cases killed. But if you get rid of it, you'll burn less fuel. You'll put less hours on your machines, less repairs to that machinery, 
and you can farm more or the same acres with less equipment and less employees. It's a time saver. So not only will you not destroy your soil, you won't kill yourself with that added work. So this is just a couple of uh, tillage regimes that are typical in my, my part of the world. This may not apply to anybody else on this webinar, but it is very relevant here. So if you just cut tillage out, you can put $80 an acre in your pocket. So if I cut $80 an acre out across 8,000 acres, that is a substantial amount of money that I could do something else with or just not spend. So just something to think about. So this is what we used to look like. Uh, it was very similar to the picture Rick showed earlier. Uh, we used to start clean, stay clean. I don't know if y'all have heard those commercials, but it was in every farm magazine on all the uh, country radio stations around here. Everybody pushing chemicals. Well, that meant stay broke for us. Um, that is impossible to do where I'm from. Palmer pigweed is resistant to six modes of action of herbicide. So you can start clean with Paraquat, but you are not going to stay clean with herbicides. Uh, you can spin and spin, and you'll clean your bank account out, but you won't clean your fields up. So this picture is hard to see, but if you look really close, you can see a lot of green dots, little cotyledon pigweeds, and they are covering that screen. So if you look good there, you'll see them. But that's what happens when you till in my part of the world. And this is from this fall. We had some... Uh, land forming done. So you till, you get a flush of pigweeds, even to this day. So, you know, those seeds stay viable in the soil for a long time. But if you don't till, if you leave residue on the soil, you don't see that. It's clean. You just let them sleep. Leave them in the ground. They're not hurting you as seeds. They're actually good food for earthworms and other macro fauna. So just leave them in there. Just don't, don't wake them up. So now we are planting something all the time. Like this picture here is behind the corn field, You're right behind the combine, we're drilling cover crops. We plant, we chemically terminate cover crops, we pull a small furrow for irrigation, that's the extent of our soil disturbance. And then our herbicide program is just a fraction of what it once was. I mean, probably 25%, 30% of what it once was. So huge savings there. Um, but we have to get our fields covered. That's the cornerstone of all of it. Cover crops for us are so vital. They, you have to get them in. Uh, so like this fall, it was kind of wet here. We actually pulled guys off the harvest crew to run our grain drills 24 hours a day to get cover crops planted in our few windows of dry time we had. So, uh, you know, I hear a lot of times that I can't afford cover crops, so on and so forth. Well, when you compare what my 15 to $20 an acre cover crop planting uh, cost compared to fall tillage, fall applied herbicides, winter burn down, spring tillage, bed prep, et cetera, like we used to do and like everybody around me still does, uh, that excuse is not relevant anymore. So this is what our fields look like now. This is taken just a few weeks ago. Uh, stuff's starting to get big and green now, uh, but everything is green, covered. There's something growing on it. And uh, it's um, this is what we want to look like this time of year. Um, but this is what we want to look like at planting. You know, I'm 6'3", and I'm taking those pictures, and that cover crop is at eye level. There's winter pea in there, cereal rob, there's some oats, vetch. Uh, there were some radishes in there, but they have uh, winter killed and rotted at this point. But above ground biomass is huge for our weed control, our infiltration rates, feeding that soil biota, um, and just keeping soil cool and in, in, in the middle of summer. So that's what we want to plan into. Uh, um, this is a from this spring. Uh, this is what I was about to plant cotton into. I did I did plant cotton into. So uh, that's as tall as it was here, and all the benefits mentioned again. And then um, we uh, planted. Now we're experimenting with 76 inch cotton. We've we've grown non non GMO cotton with success in this system, but now we are uh, 
trying GMO with much less seed. Uh, it's an experimental phase currently. So it's one in, one out skip row. But typical seeding rates are around here at 40,000 seeds per acre. We dropped to 20 this year. Uh, we need to be down around 15, I've figured out. Um, so I'm going to plant 16 and try to end up with a final plant stand of 15,000 plants per acre. Uh, so you can see roughly there the savings of that um, just by cutting that seeding rate. And then we treat our seeds ourselves. We get them as black seed or basic, as basic of a seed treatment as possible. We use the metacloprid if needed, but primarily we just treat our seed with food sources for microbe uh, proliferation. We want, as soon as that seed germinates and puts a root down, we want microbes attracted to it and colonizing those roots. And I think we've got a video of that planter running here. Okay, so you can see our planting equipment's not that not that fancy. You don't need a lot of fancy gadgets or expensive equipment to uh, to plant into this system. Now, that around me makes cotton farmers almost faint because uh, they want to plant cotton a quarter inch deep, and you know I'm planting through four inches of residue and and uh, then putting the cotton an inch in the ground. So. Uh, so you're you're thinking, well, can you get a get a stand of cotton through that? Um, if I can get my thing to go again. There it goes. Yeah, so we cut through the residue. You can see our seed to soil contact there. It's good, about an inch deep. Um, there's the cotton coming through the residue. Um, and then I, I want to briefly mention Greenbridge because we hear this a lot. Uh, is it possible to destroy a cash crop such as cotton by harboring pests in cover crops? Uh, it is, but not if you manage it properly. It, it's not very probable. You can cause problems, but I don't. I have not seen any problems in my transition to doing this, but we manage properly. And I think we've got a, another video here of this stand of cotton. Yeah, so this is that stand of cotton, um, 76 inch. It looks like almost every plant came up, but what I did not see in my scouting was, and I, and I rarely see as, stand loss due to slugs or cutworms or or thrips or any of those things um i mean that is a good stand of cotton it's actually too good it's a little too thick so um so can you can you destroy a crop yeah you can but it's not probable if managed properly so you got to understand the pest prey cycle um, and unfortunately, a lot of farmers, and um, I hate to say it, but, you know, extension and people don't, uh, consultants don't. They just rely so heavily on insecticides that they forget that there's a plethora of insects out there that will do all of this work for you. And they work for free. They work for free. That is the biggest thing that I like about them. So, uh, you know, it's a cycle. Uh, prey comes first and then predator comes second and this works everywhere in nature you're not going to have you know an abundance of predators unless there's a food source of some kind so you can accomplish attracting predators two ways with those insectary strips like Gwendolyn talked about to get the adults in there and then when the prey shows up you have an abundance of adults that can feed on those insects and lay uh, eggs or, or uh, parasitize those pest insects they're already ready to go. So um, you don't want to go out and just bomb your cover crop with insecticide because your consultant tells you to, because he doesn't understand the predator prey cycle. Uh, you know, it, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure there. So what we typically see on our farm is we'll see those increases in those prey and predator insects prior to planting, but that system equalizes. 
you know, the predators show up and everything just kind of planes out. Um, we don't have to spray insects as much as our conventional neighbors. So uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, fertility is another place we are seeing uh, major input reductions. So this cotton crop I'm showing you today um, just got 300 pounds of AMS uh, one month prior to planting. Uh, the field that it's on and most of my fields have not had any granular P or K since 2016. Uh, we use an inferral starter consisting of micronutrients and then again food sources for microbiology. Uh, really cheap and it's not for the plant as much as it's for the soil microbiota surrounding the root zone. We want that revved up as high as possible as soon as that seed sticks a radical out. So that's what we try to focus on. Uh, just on the fertility, you may have to zoom into this to see, but you know, this is grid results from fall 2016 and then SAP results from the same field in 2019. And the two things I want you to notice are the P and the K levels. Uh, in that plant, P and K are high. They're, they're actually, uh, the P is actually uh, elevated. So it's off the, off the chart and the K is in the high range. So, you know, do we need to put out grain or P and K every year? I don't think so. I think the more you cycle nutrients and the deeper your roots go, uh, the less you're going to need those things. And nitrogen is, we're making reductions in nitrogen as well. You know, that 300 pounds of AMS for that cotton crop we made is about a half rate of the state uh, standard around me. So major reductions in fertility inputs. But what we figured out in all my neighbors need to figure out is over fertilization leads to increased pest problems, increased disease, increased vegetative growth, you know, destruction of soil aggregates and soil life, and it, it decreases our pH in our area. I mean, there's farmers around me that just pour on urea and things and then have to apply lime every three years because their pH falls out. Um, and then another thing we see commonly here is deficiency symptoms of, an, of a nutrient because another nutrient level is too high and it doesn't allow uptake by the plant because everybody that's just dumping fertilizer on it thinks that plants just suck up fertilizer with mass flow with the water. That's part of it, but that is just a small fraction. Most of your nutrient uptake in plants is facilitated by a microbe. And if you kill all of your microbes with these synthetic fertilizers, you're gonna see those deficiencies and you're gonna you know, hurt the potential of those plants to to make you money. Uh, so nitrates, excessive nitrates is a is a big problem. And since we've reduced our nitrogen inputs, we've seen less pests, less disease, less vegetative growth. You can't sell vegetative growth on a cotton plant. That's not what you take to the gin. So you need to try to minimize that. So the other thing we've seen since we've reduced our synthetic inputs or fertility inputs is, is enhanced root growth. You know, we have roots that just explode out of the seed now, and it's because they're not encountering high rates of, you know, salty synthetic fertilizers as soon as they germinate. Um, and roots are the key to everything. The bigger the root system, the less fertility inputs you're going to need, the less irrigation you're going to need. And when you reduce those inputs, your soil life just comes back. I mean, the cut between cover crops and the root exudates from those plants and reducing those salty synthetic fertilizers, it's just amazing the change that can happen in your soil. And then we're seeing it firsthand. So weed control, which is the whole reason we got into um, cover crops, has been just made so easy because we are keeping that mat on the ground and using it as a barrier. Um, you know, 76 inch cotton, people around me plant 30 and 38 inch cotton to for a quick canopy closure because they need that shade to stop weeds. Well, if you have a thick mat of cover crop on the ground, you've already got that built in. You've already, it's already there. So there's no sunlight hitting that soil for weed seed to germinate. So our weed control is just you know, it's, it's really inexpensive compared to the state averages. 
And this is the typical uh, program. This is actually what we used on this 76 inch cotton experiment. Uh, so you can see all the actives we used and the rates there. And then, uh, then the cost to put all those out was about $38 an acre. Um, and again, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we were spending between 100 and 150 prior to this system. So, you know, huge savings there. Okay, back to the insect control. Um, you know, with the increased uh, biodiversity of plants and the elimination of excessive nitrates, we're seeing less infestation of pest insects. So, you look at the state average sprays on the left, this was from 2019. Uh, Bollworms were sprayed two and a half times. Uh, this is across all technologies, so from conventional all the way to the third generation BT stuff. Uh, and then plant bugs or ligus were sprayed four and a half times as a, as a uh, state average. So, uh, and then underneath each of those is, is what the standard for control is. So diamides for Lepidopterans that can run you between twelve and eighteen dollars plus application cost, and then ligus is usually a tank mix uh, because single modes of action here have been abused so much that uh, it takes um, two to three modes of action to kill an infestation of ligus. Uh, so that'll run you ten to eighteen dollars plus application cost. Well, in our system, the beneficial insects are doing most of the work. We had to spray ligus. But we were able to spray with a metacloprid, which is uh, very easy on adult beneficial insects because uh, they don't feed on plants and the metacloprid is systemic to the plant. So uh, we were able to maintain our predators and knock the ligus populations down for about $3 an acre. So um, big savings. So these predators that we've talked about a number, num, number of times a day, when you don't bomb them with broad spectrum insecticide and provide them habitat, they will do the work for you. Ligus is one of the most heavily predated insects in cotton in the Mid-South period, uh, probably led only by aphids and lepidopterans. Uh, so there are plenty of insects that can do the work for you. And when you leave them alone and don't kill them, They'll take care of these problems for you. I mean, that's that's how this system evolved. Uh, if you let this ecosystem thrive, it will it will save you a ton of money. Irrigation in the mid south is huge. We get 60 inches of rainfall. We still have to irrigate. That's how poor our soils are. So we're working hard to improve them, and we're trying to improve them by reducing uh, evaporation with the main maintaining this. Um, matter residue and increasing inf infiltration through uh, better soil structure. So we're trying really hard to get away from um, irrigation, um, you know, at least mitigate what we have to do as much as we can. But those are the ways we're doing it. Um, and this is another video just showing how effective this cover crop residue can be. Okay, so I'm, I'm checking here. We've got about three or four leaf cotton and uh, it's been hot and dry. I want to see if I need to spin my pivot, but I scrape my residue back and I've got wet dirt to the top. When I take about 10 steps to a turn row and you can see why I wanted to turn my pivot on because that's gunpowder. Um, you know, the only difference between that spot and the other spot is about I don't know, 10 yards and a four inch matter residue. So um, that cover crop residue is hugely effective at minimizing evaporation losses. This is another great example. I know this is in corn and this is a cotton talk, but I could not pass up putting this picture in here. So let me, let me preface this. Uh, this picture was taken on a Monday morning about 10 o'clock. Uh, I've got a conventional tilled field on your top left. Uh, you can decide whether or not that's pineapples or corn. Uh, and then on the right is a no-till cover crop for four years, uh, big biodiversity, big biomass um, field. 
And then on the bottom there, that's the amount of moisture that was in the soil on the top, just when we got right out of the top. So as I said, this picture was taken on a Monday at 10. We got a two inch rain in 30 minutes the pr previous Friday. So two days prior, we got a two inch rain in 30 minutes. Uh, so we did infiltration uh, rain studies there. And you can see on the conventional till, we had a half to an inch per hour of infiltration rate. Uh, half an inch to an inch and then on the long term no till and cover crop six to eight inches per hour so if you just do a little quick math two inches over 30 minutes uh, the field on the left there got about a quarter inch of rain the rest of it went in the ditch um, the other field long term cover crop and no till uh, soaked up every bit of it and those fields are right across the turn row from each other so two different production practices right across maybe 20 yards apart. So it didn't rain more on one side than the other. I've, I've heard that before, but that was not the case here. So 76 inch cotton is, you know, in those low seeding rates, I get the question of, well, I get told all the time, I really don't get questions. I get told that that's not enough seed to make cotton. Well, I beg to differ. Um, this is 76 inch cotton from this year and that stuff is stacked up it was planted uh, may 28th which for us is a full month behind optimum planting time so i was actually nervous even planting this cotton um i was just so late because it rained so much this spring um but i had the seed so i wanted to plant it and i'm glad i did because even at that late of a planting date which is not even close to optimum we were able to make good cotton. Um, it actually made about 1,100 pounds. Uh, for my area, planted 1st of June, that is spectacular. Um, so this is my return on investment. This is my variable cost, what it cost me to do to make that crop in variable cost, not counting you know fixed costs like machinery and, and overhead, you know, like labor, but um, on 1,100 pounds, after after a variable cost, I had $586 an acre to play with to pay my equipment costs and my labor and other overhead. I mean, 10 years ago, I would have killed for $75 to $100 an acre over net, and that doesn't pay a lot of bills. Um, so this system, this regenerative system and this wide row stuff is you know, it's, it's, it's the most profitable cotton I've ever made. Um, it's not the highest yielding by a long shot. You know, we've made 17, 1800 pound cotton, but it is by far the most profitable. So that tells me um, that chasing high yields uh, doesn't work for me. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is we're adding livestock to add value to these cotton acres. So we're going to start interseeding our wide row cotton so we can turn livestock in right behind the picker. They can eat the rest of the cotton lint and seed, uh, and then we'll have green forage underneath for them to feed on through the winter, and we will intensively graze, uh, paddock graze, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we just ran some quick numbers. We're actually in our second year of doing this. Uh, the first year, we added $800 an acre in value with the cattle to that cotton acre. So, you take that plus the 586, you're looking pretty good. Sheep, we're trying this year. Um, we can put many more animal units and they have a higher price. Um, so obviously that 3,500 is a forecast number. I don't expect to be anywhere close to that, but if I can get half of it, then that is a huge value add to a cotton maker. Um, so just uh, another thing that regenerative ag can, can bring to your operation if you're willing to deal with animals and manage them. So again, just to reiterate, just because everything's been done a certain way for a long time, and that's how people tell you it's gotta be, it, that's not how it's gotta be. Um, you need to forget what you know about cotton production and, and just uh, relearn it all. Relearn it all from the ground up. Cotton plants are capable of doing things that we have not even, we just can't even imagine as far as compensating for space and time, they can add 
they can be so much more efficient than we're treating them now. And, and, and that's a, the way we're treating them is not a function of good science. It is a function of good sales. Um, they want to sell seed, so 40,000 is how many you need to plant. They want to sell chemicals, so kill it all, kill everything. That's just not good business. It's not good for uh, the image of farming. And uh, if I'd have been doing it that way in the last 10 years, I'd be broke. So um, I think Rex will, uh, thanks for having me, guys. I, I, I had a good time with this uh, webinar, but uh, I'll turn that back over to y'all. And, and I guess we'll go to questions or yeah yeah we got a few minutes for questions and and adam thank you very much that was pretty for me that was pretty inspirational and makes me makes me smile so um we got a few questions um uh one of my colleagues has a crop insurance question but i'm i want to ask a few other questions uh first um if you could talk to a uh new farmer or a farmer that's new to cover cropping um what would you recommend to him uh starting down the same route that you started down 10 years ago um well i would try to tell him to temp temper his fear uh, you know fear of missing out is is a big deal uh, when you change things you think if you change something you're going to you're going to leave money on the table. You know, you start in your comfort zone. That may be 40 acres. In my case, it was everything I could afford. Uh, but start simple, start small. And as your confidence grows, uh, you know, increase your diversity of the mix, the how big you let it get. Um, but when I started, there weren't any resources uh, in my area. Now there are tons of resources. So, you know, you can reach out to me or another farmer in your area. And if you've got a question or, or a, a hesitation, I guarantee there's a farmer somewhere that has had that exact problem and has figured it out. So I would just say start in your comfort zone with something that's easy and just ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help uh, because there's there's been I've, I've failed plenty of times. Uh, you, if, if my brother was on here, he he may be slinging some cuss words at me. How many times I've failed? So, uh, but but that's you know that's how we learn. So uh, that's what okay. I would say. Well, and that is a segue into the next question. Like, what were initially your best sources of information, and what would you recommend? I I know you uh, suggested other farmers, but. Uh, what are your best sources of information about, you know, managing cover crops in a system like this? I can tell you the best, the best um, information source are other farmers. So I would encourage anybody that's trying to start down this path to go to meetings during the winter, like uh, no-till on the plains, uh, high plains no-till. You know, there's so many good ones. Uh, there's a lot of good uh, state level meetings you know missouri does a really good job about putting on uh cover crop meetings uh we have a group in arkansas called the arkansas soil health alliance that we put on workshops and meetings uh, to try to help farmers learn how to adopt regenerative practices but the meetings have great information but the networking that you get to do at those meetings that's where the real the real magic is because you get to talk to farmers who are in this system and uh, and go from there uh, there's lots of resources within rcs and things you know about basic information but the unfortunate thing about those things are is they kind of are blanket statements and this is not a blanket system what works on my farm probably will not work on your farm and it has to be figured out individually it's an individual journey but network and go to meetings those are the best those are the best things to do Okay, and just two more questions because we're running out of time here. Uh, you mentioned NRCS. NRCS does have cost share for cover crop seed. Have you taken advantage of any of those programs? I have. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, I was broke, so I had to have help to get started. Um, you know, and CSP and Equip have 
were, were huge for me in the beginning to get going. You know, they allowed me to experiment and expand the acres that I planted where uh, for those first few years, I just couldn't afford to plant as much as I would have liked to on my own. So yeah, those, pro those programs are hugely beneficial, especially if you're, you know, like I was and, and you got your back against the wall financially. I mean, they're, they're just lifesavers. So I would um, definitely recommend signing up for those and, and utilizing those programs if you haven't. Uh, right. And that's um, conservation stewardship program. The CSP and the EQIP is an environmental quality incentive program. Yes. Yes. And but, they both have uh, good, good programs to, for purchasing cover crop seed and things. So it's just, yeah, those are great programs. Great. And um, one of my colleagues who is uh, very um, fascinated with crop insurance uh, asked a question, do you access crop insurance programs? Uh, yeah, so in Arkansas, we're, we're kind of, I don't know why Arkansas is so different. You know, there, there's lots of parts of the country that you actually see, receive a premium discount if you use cover crops. And thus far, Arkansas does not fit that. They don't discourage you from using them they don't disqualify you if you use them but uh we're not on the same page with with the rest of the country as far as the premium because and we should be because they obviously mitigate risk and that's what crop insurance wants you to do they want to collect your premium and then not ever pay you anything <laughs> so they ought to encourage the use of cover crops uh as far as the way we're growing cotton now um that is another one that i'm working with uh RMA on about uh, skip row cotton in being insured in Arkansas. So far, I've only been able to experiment because skip row cotton is not insurable in Arkansas, but it is insurable in every state that touches Arkansas. So why it's not insurable in Arkansas, I don't know, but that's something you might want to check on uh, if you are uh, required to carry insurance through your bank or whatever. Uh, make sure if you're going to try this wide row low population cotton, which is obviously more profitable than the standard, um, check with your insurance agent because you may be in one of those oddball states like I am. So, um, but we're trying to address that. There's no reason Arkansas shouldn't be insured just like all the states surrounding it. So I'm hoping we'll get that straightened out before this cropping season. Good, good. Well, I think that about does it. And I want to thank, um, very much, Gwendolyn Ellen, uh, who's up in Corvallis, Oregon, and Adam, thank you very much for sharing your experience and wisdom in the world of cover crops and integrating them into your systems. Um, I would note that uh, this webinar will has been recorded and it will be posted to the ATRA website um, within a couple of weeks, and uh, it's available to everybody. And if folks have questions about anything that was talked about here, you can contact the ATRA project or um, any of our speakers and we can provide uh, contact information for them. So thank you everybody uh, for attending and I hope uh, everybody learned something and please uh, uh, fill out that brief survey at the end and uh, I think we'll call it call it a day. Thank you very much.